day, they were all literally 24-hour periods. God created the world literally in six days, and he did it supernaturally. And I don't need any evolution to prove that the Bible is true or compromise. So please, hold your questions, comments, and current concerns until we go on to the next parts of this message, which will basically be covering just the gap. All right? Thank you for listening. All right, well, we're going to get uh, right into the message here. This is going to be uh, the gap part two. Um, one thing I wanted to mention, i got to go back to the whole age theory thing real quick because uh, I failed to mention this, and it is very important, but it won't take long. Um, sometimes uh, the word day will mean something other than a 24-hour day. And can anybody point me in the right direction here? Does anybody know what I'm talking about? The day of the Lord. The day of the Lord, uh, Daniel's 70th week. That's a week, and the days in that week are definitely not 24-hour days. Each day is a year, seven years. But that's a prophetic week. And so there's a difference between a prophetic week and the literally the word day. And again, Scripture will always interpret itself, and I don't see that in uh, Genesis chapter 1 at all. So I just wanted to make sure I said that because I failed to mention that last last time. Okay, back to the gap. Last week's, we, uh, blah, excuse me, I didn't get much sleep. Last week I explained that there are some Bible believers that believe in a gap between Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2. There are many different ideas as to what happened in this gap. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, there are many different ideas as to what happened in this gap and how long it lasted. I explained that I believe the gap was introduced and taught as a way to fit a supposed evolutionary science and teaching into the Bible. And, of course, there are many Christians who do not believe in evolution or the Big Bang, uh, but still believe in a gap. In other words, they don't fully take the Clarence Larkin view of the gap. But I do think that that is the type of teaching uh, that got the whole gap thing started. So, again, I, I always have to explain my position. All right. Now, when I was explaining this last week, I realized that I didn't give a super accurate description of what the gap could be. And I kind of wanted to do that today for the sake of our listeners because some of you out there may not have a clue as to what this really is. All right. So I want to make sure I explain it before I give you my what I think are the arguments against it. All right. And I'm going to try to fit all the views in here because I, I did explain some of the views, but uh, for, for clarity's sake. If there is a gap between Genesis 1 1 and 1 2, it would go something like this God created the heaven and the earth. How that was done, nobody's 100% sure. It was either done by kind of an evolution process where it took thousands or millions of years, that's one take on it, or it could be that. God had a creation week like he did after Genesis 1-2. Not 100% sure on that one. All right. And again, I'm not speaking for what I believe. I'm, I'm trying to give you a full view of what everybody takes this gap thing to, to be. Now, at some point in time, there was either an angelic race of beings or there was a human race of beings or it's possible there weren't any. It just depends on what you believe about the gap. But something happened, the thing fell apart, and God judged that pre-Adamite, I'll call it, or pre-creation week, Genesis 1-3 on, uh, Earth, with a pre-flood of Noah. Okay, I, I hope you get what I'm, I'm saying. All right. So, when you get to Genesis 1-2, that water that's being talked about, well, that's, that's a flood. And God destroyed the supposed first earth with a flood. Then we get into a recreation week. And God recreates everything, literally, in 24-hour periods. And then he rests on the seventh day. That date makes the flood of Noah the second time that God flooded the earth. And, of course, he promised to never do it. And when God restores or, or makes new uh, heaven and earth, 
back there in Revelation and he talks about it in Isaiah, that's actually going to be a kind of a third restoration. All right, so if you did not get it before, I'm explaining it again for clarity's sake. There are all kinds of different takes on that gap. I tried to do the best I could to kind of fit them all together. I'm, if you believe in the gap, you have to believe kind of in one of those brands. All right, <clears throat> now I don't have uh, these supporting scriptures uh, or arguments against the gap in any long flowing chain so that magically at the end of this message uh, it will come out like a beautiful rose garden. That just doesn't seem to be how it goes for me. Uh, but I hope it will make some sense. So here we go with the common Jesse backwards brain hurting technique. Uh, so here's the first argument uh, for the gap, and then I'm going to give you my rebuttal for it. If you turn to Genesis uh, 128, Genesis 128, what's neat about this this particular section I'm going to teach is how amazing God's Word is and how how much we don't need a lot of the tools that we use today to understand what God's Word says in English. In Genesis 1.28, God tells Adam and Eve, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth and subdue it. Since there was a flood that killed the pre-Adamite race of humans, God is telling Adam and Eve to replenish or refill the earth again. You may not believe that version of the gap, so if you don't, well, that's fine. If you do, hear what I think the Bible says about it. All right, so let's let's take a look here uh, at this word replenish. If you look in a modern dictionary, uh, which I have two of them here, um, this one here is the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. I think this is copyright 1979. Yep. Uh, let's go to replenish here. Replenish. Repent. I'll find it. Replenish. To fill or build up again. To stock or supply anew. So in 1997, that's what the word replenish meant in modern English. All right, that's that's one dictionary. I also have with me my old Thorndike Barnhart dictionary that I got in third grade. I had a rough time uh, reading. It's amazing. God put me where he did today. And this is cop- copyright 1979. And if we take a look at the word replenish in this dictionary, let me find it here. Replenish. Fill again. Provide a new supply. Uh, now listen to the example they give. I think this is funny. Once our natural resources are used up, we cannot replenish them. I wonder what they're trying to teach in this dictionary. Evolution, maybe? Anyway, I just I thought that was funny. I didn't make that up, by the way. You can go check it yourself. So the common definition for replenish is to fill again. Now, um, God said that he would preserve his word. He never said he'd preserve the English language. And, of course, if you read God's word, you can find out what it says. Interesting, interestingly enough, the word replenish in English, as far as dictionaries were concerned, changed in 1892. See, the primary meaning of the word replenish used to mean to fill. That was it didn't mean to fill again. It meant to fill. A new version of or, or definition of the word replenish was introduced before 1892, which meant to fill again. So there were two definitions to it. One, to fill, and two, to fill again. The primary definition changed in 1892 to fill again, and eventually my dictionaries don't even have to fill in them. It's not even an option. But if you look at Noah Webster's 1828, which I have here, uh, and I, let's go back here. I had this marked. I guess my bookmark fell out. R-E-P. R-E-P. Okay. I don't know if I'm fine. 
Uh, here we go. Replenish. In 1828, it meant to fill, to stock with numbers or abundance. And the, the, what they give as examples, the magazines are replenished with corn, the springs are replenished with water. And even back in 1828, uh, the second definition was only to finish, to complete. Uh, now down below, and, and actually they say by this time that that was not in, in use. It just meant to fill. Uh, they had to recover former fullness underneath that, um, if you haven't known Webster's 1828. Now here's the best part of it. I didn't need to know that from the 1828 to figure out what God said. So I'm going to show you how you can do, how you can do this just using the King James Bible. Because sometimes... Like the word Nicolaitans? No, Webster says that's not the religious people trying to have authority over people, which we know that to be true. He doesn't give that definition. So you can't always rely on the words of men. So let's just use the word of God. Let me explain this to you. A lot of children and a lot of teenagers learned vocabulary back in the day from this King James Bible. And the way they did it was by reading it, because the Bible always defines itself. This is an interesting technique that has been somewhat lost, but the fact is anybody who reads a lot knows more vocabulary because even in secular books and in other writings, this technique commonly happens, but God does it all the time in his word. This is amazing. All right. Let's go to Genesis uh, 122. I know there'll be some arguments against this, but... This has to do with combinations of words and context. Genesis 1.22. Let's, let's just do Genesis 1.21 here. And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every wing, winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, watch the word combination, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas, and let fowl multiply in the earth. So after be fruitful and multiply, the words and fill were spoken there. I know the argument for this would be, well, there may not have been animals in the pre-Adamite world. So God would only tell, God, God would only tell the animals to, to multiply. And that's, that's fish and fowl right there. Um, that are multiplying. Now, I say that that doesn't make a whole lot of sense because then you run into the same thing, things as the day-age theory if you believe in a pre-Adamite race of humans. Okay? So we have problems with that. Now, look at the word combination over here in Genesis 128. And God, uh, uh, get, let's get context. Genesis 127. So God created man in his own image. and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Now who is that? Who did he create? Yeah, Adam and Eve. Verse 28. And God blessed them, the Adam and Eve. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Replenish the earth. And subdue it. Now that's one example of what, what we're going to see here. Again, the argument could be, well, he said fill to the animals because they didn't exist in the pre-Adamite world. And he said fill again to Adam and Eve because there were humans before. So he's using a different word. Well, I'm going to show you that can't be so. Go over to Genesis chapter 8. Because here, God is simply talking to humans now. Genesis chapter 8, verses 15 through 17. I bring this one up because this is a very common argument. Uh, one of the greater arguments used. That's why I'm going to spend so much time on this one and hopefully trail off my time on some other ones. <clears throat> Genesis eight fifteen through 17. And God spake unto Noah, saying, Go forth of the ark. So this is after the flood of Noah. Go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife and thy sons, and thy sons' wives with thee. Bring forth with every living thing that is with thee, <clears throat> of all flesh, both of fowl and of cattle and of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. <clears throat> uh, uh, now he's talking about 
he's talking about animals here. <clears throat> but we're going to see down in Genesis 9, he's talking to humans. Of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, that they may breed abundantly in the earth and be fruitful and multiply upon the earth. So here we see uh, breed abundantly. Okay, Let's remember breed abundantly. This is, these are all clues to the puzzle. Genesis 9.1. <clears throat> Genesis 9.1. Let's jump down here. Now God is definitely talking to humans here. He says, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Now again, you could say, well, I still haven't heard anything good that says that replenish simply means to fill. Jump down to Genesis 1.7. God speaking to Noah and his sons. Oh, correction. Yeah, Genesis 9.7. What did I say? Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, Genesis 9.7. And you, be fruitful and multiply, bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply therein. Now, I'll, I, just for the record, God never told them to do it again. He never said to do it again. And this time he's talking to humans. See, sometimes people will use the whole typology thing against uh, non-gap people. They'll say, well, Noah was a type of Adam because he had three sons. Judge, and judgment came before both. You know, there was a flood be before uh, both people. Well, that, that I don't buy. And this, this is only trying to tell you the definition of replenish. Based on what we see here, replenish would basically be two things put together. To fill, not fill again, right? And what's the other one? To do it abundantly. What's the definition we got out of Noah Webster's 1828? To fill abundantly. That's what the word replenish means. And we didn't have to go to a dictionary to figure that out. We simply took a look at what God's word said. And it's interesting in the order God did that. That's how God teaches you definitions of words. But it gets even more interesting than that. The word replenish is used in, in Isaiah 2, 6, 23, 2, Jeremiah 31, 25, which we will look at, Ezekiel 26, 2, and Ezekiel 27, 25. And I checked each one of those references. You go ahead on your own time and check those references. I don't see anything in those verses that have anything to do with filling again. I don't. So you go check that stuff. But let's go to Jeremiah 31.14. <clears throat> Jeremiah 31.14. We're going to actually look at the a definition of another word, but we're going to use replenish in the King James Bible to figure out what this other word means. And then I'm going to give you the definition out of the No Webster's 1828 and see if you can guess it before I give it to you. This is amazing. This is amazing. Jeremiah 31, <clears throat> 14. Um, and I will satiate the soul of the priests with fatness, and my people shall be satisfied with my goodness, saith the Lord. There's an interesting word in there, satiate. Does anybody know what satiate means? Head non, hand raised. No. Okay. We don't know what satiate means. And you're like, what in the world does this have to do with replenish? You'll see. All right. Uh, keep your finger there and turn over to Jeremiah 46.10. And you might want to keep your finger here too. You might be using a couple fingers. Jeremiah 46.10. For this is the day of the Lord God of hosts, a day of vengeance, that he may avenge him of his adversaries. And the sword shall devour, and it shall be satiate and made drunk with their blood. For the Lord God of hosts has uh, sacrificed in the north country by the river Euphrates. We see that word again, satiate. What in the world? What does that have to do with replenish? Keeping your finger in those other spots, turn to Jeremiah 31.25. This is just amazing. 
I never seen this before. Jeremiah thirty one twenty five says, For I have satiated that would be the past tense version of satiate, satiated the weary soul, and I have replenished every sorrowful soul. Okay, let's put this together now. We don't know what satiate means, but we know what replenish means now, because God showed us in his word. It means to fill and to do it abundantly. If you go back to Jeremiah 31.14 and read that, it says, I will satiate the soul of the priest with fatness, and my people shall be satisfied with my goodness, saith the Lord. I would venture to guess, the way God explained that in that verse, that it means to be satisfied, or it has that connotation. All right. So my guess, if I had to guess here, and I guessed this before I look at Noah Webster's 1828, by the way. I'm not lying. God knows this. I figured that it meant to fill abundantly and be satisfied. That's what I think the word satiate means. All right. Now let's take a look over at Jeremiah 46.10 and see if this makes any sense. Now that God taught us what the word satiate means, using the word satisfied and replenish, read it and, and think about this. For this is the day of the Lord God of hosts, a day of vengeance, that he may avenge him of his adversaries, and the sword shall devour. It shall be satiate and made drunk with their blood. Does that make sense now? And it's interesting, too, because and made drunk with their blood also adds to the word satiate. It even defines it more. For the Lord God of hosts made a sacrifice in the north country of the river Euphrates. I think satiate means to be filled abundantly and satisfied and basically uh, more than satisfied. Because you know that when you're drunk, you've had more than you can handle. Got me? Watch this. This is amazing. Let's look at Noah Webster's 1828 and look at the definition of the satiate. Satiate. To fill, to satisfy appetite or desire, to feed to the full, or to fur furnish enjoyment to the extent of desire, as to satiate appetite or sense, to fill to the extent of want, as to satiate the earth or plants with water, to glut, to fill beyond natural desire, to gratify desire to the utmost, to saturate. Isn't that amazing? Man, what a book. Wouldn't make a whole lot of sense if the word replenishment 